Dennis, uh, my question is for you. Uh, you said when, when uh, the integration is taking place unloaded, it's, uh, there is no stimulation on it. Then in another part of your lecture, you said that there's more condensation when there's stimulation to bone. How do you reconcile those two thoughts? Yeah. One, one is the bone to implant contact versus the bone around it. The bone around an implant that's functionally loaded, Wolf's Law, you'll tend to see an increased density radiographically and histologically. But the bone to implant contact during loading is still open to discussion. So it's the bone around the implant, that is what does increase if it's not overloaded. The bone up against the implant, uh, that's open to discussion. There's three different articles with three different outcomes. So we don't see, one's right up against the surface, the other one's a millimeter outside of the surface. Yes. When you make the decision, immediate loading or not, do you make the, take patient's overall health into consideration, gender, or a, the, a smoking or not, those factors? Uh, yeah. Um, the general uh, decision is if the patient can undergo elective procedure, they are then candidate for immediate loading. The rest are local decisions. Yeah, I think that's rather important to, to make sure that people understand that if you're, uh, obviously if someone's a little bit medically compromised, you might, might, might not want to have them sit there for long periods of time, but putting an implant in, if they can sit there for an extraction on the local anesthetic in your office and are well enough for that, they, they're usually well enough to have an implant. Go ahead. Uh, this is if, for if you do an uh, immediate implant on a number eight, and uh, then you go ahead and put on your abutment, and then you bond it to seven and nine, are you occlusally loaded or non-occlusally loaded? And, you're, and what to seven and nine? And you're, are you, do you bond it to seven and nine? Are you occlusally loaded or not occlusally loaded? If I place an implant at eight and I have, an abut I have adjacent teeth in seven and nine, um, provided the soft tissue envelope is correct, I wouldn't load it immediately. I'll just let it heal as a second stage, as a delayed loading. Why risk? Uh, that's exactly what I said also. There's no reason to put a single tooth implant into occlusion if you already have a temporary on the adjacent teeth. Uh, there's really no reason to do that whatsoever. It just puts it in jeopardy, especially if it's a straight line like that. At the center front microphone, Yes. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Thank you. Both presenters felt very strong about cross arch stabilization and documented literature where they showed good implant integration with immediate load and function with temporization. However, when the discussion about guided surgery came out in Noble Guide, Dr. Tarnow showed a lower percentage of integration in cases using that technique with cross arch stabilization. So I would like to know what your speculation is, why you feel there's a lower percentage of take in those cases, and in both presenters' case, they talked about the skills of the surgeon being involved. And many of these techniques are novice or new techniques being utilized by people who are doing beta or novice technique. So I'd like to have both presenters discuss that. Regarding the <coughs> success rates in the immediate loading, and navigationally directed. Uh, very interesting observation from the same group. Uh, one of the only long-term uh, studies was by Van Steenberg, which they show the accuracy on uh, the navigation system. It was done actually on cadavers. And if you follow the publication, I think in 2003, 2004, by Van Aachen, the same group of Van Steenberg, they show that they Navigation system, computerized navigation system, is completely inaccurate and shows a linear deviation of 2.5 millimeter linearly. Now just imagine if you, what kind of structures and what kind of deviation you can get. Furthermore, as Danny said, once you go into a final reconstruction on the navigation system like that, or even a provisional, your chances of micromotion, which uh, many feel that is more important than, uh, for example, bruxism as a factor, this can cause very, very quick uh, failure of the system. I feel that um, I would be much more predictable, and the studies verify that, placement within 
accurate parameters without the navigation system. Because the navigation system is still to be tested. Uh, it has been launched on us, for example, in partial cases where it is completely misfit and not stable. And it is something that uh, we as a profession should study much further. Yeah, my response is very similar. Uh, the, the navigation at the final bridge work, it also depends on the accuracy of the laboratory and the transfer of what you have on the computer. In a lot of these cases, about 20% of them are not coming back fitted the way you think you have designed it on the computer, and then you're screwing it down, and the accuracy of the implant themselves may not be in all bone. They could be, as I showed you, especially with full arch cases, all slightly forward or slightly back, and now you're dehissing and you don't know it. You're actually dehissing, and so the bone is not, you're not really engaging the bone the way you think you have on the computer. I'm going to take two more questions, the gentleman up front here and then Dr. Langer, I believe, back at the center microphone. So, sir. Uh, Dr. Tornow, uh, when you're using the uh, micro implants for temporary stabilization, do you want the surfaces to integrate or not because you have to take them out? Yeah, that's a good question. The original ones were mostly machined. It depends on what you want them to be, to be done with. If, uh, this is similar to the TADs, the orthodontic, the uh, uh, assisted uh, devices. Um, what they don't want them to integrate because they're going to take them out. So you use a more machined or even polished just to get stability. But you're not, you don't want integration. We've learned that if you have machined though, it does integrate, although a little bit slower, and yet you can torque them out. A lot of our histology was where they, we just took a two millimeter uh, trep line and, and cored them out. So we don't really want them to come, uh, we want them to be used for a few months, but we usually want them to be able to come out unless like the mandibular cases I showed you, those can be textured and are textured today because those are becoming, quote, permanent type implants. But when we know we're going to take them out, then we prefer machine. Thank you. One last question. Yes, Dennis, would you address this problem or this statement that you made about the cross arch stabilization creating the highest rates of success? I was under the impression that the highest rates of success in the mandible, that is, are the ones that were done from mental foramina to mental foramina, providing that you didn't overdo the cantilever. Right. I think from a standpoint of success, one would have to also look at long-term results because I think that's what led us into this osseointegration field. And to my knowledge, I think that the published material up to now shows that the mandible has the highest success when it's done for mental foramina because there is a flexion of the mandible. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, some of the reasons why people added more implants posteriorly is because the frameworks and the materials were changed from acrylic to porcelain and they felt that the porcelain frameworks would fracture if you only had mental foramina implants. So if either of you could comment on that, um, because the maxilla, of course, is a whole totally different situation. But the mandible, that's what my impression was. Quickly. Well, I think it's, more do it's certainly documented that uh, long-term intermental stability can be achieved and long-term osseous integration occurs but also documented in, in the total mandible. But in general, I think that people placed more posteriorly the implants to, to avoid any cantilever and give the patient first molar, second molar occlusion. That's, that was my direction, at least, in placing posteriorly as well. In the, uh, Bert, in the original data, they would, uh, the Nobel people were asking for 13 millimeter long implants in some of these cases as a minimum uh, to use for the standard and they were using one laboratory. What's happened over the time is that people are using all different types of implants in all different kind of places. If you look at uh, Kamiyama's work, you, he had more failures in the mandible, which was really very, very interesting. He had more failures in the mandible than in the maxilla. Now, whether that's from flexion, as you said, the flexion, as you know from uh, Holbrook's work, is really hundreds of mic hundreds, it's about maybe 10 to 15 microns. Uh, the most, about 50, depending on how far back you go. Uh, and it's not always present, but that may or may not be a, a reason for the flexion to cause a de integration of the back implants. We don't see that as being a problem if you go up to the first molar. When we go past the first molar, that flexion might be a factor. But to bring it back to, to reality, the, these cases were uh, both, if they don't have large cantilevers, can work. 
The anterior mandible, you increased, of course, the density of the bone, as you, own, as you know so well, and that gives you extra security to be able to survive. But if you have the cross arch stabilization, even in somewhat soft bone, you can definitely get the same kind of results, and that's what we've seen, but, uh, and that's why the data is holding up pretty well in the maxilla. The real problem is the fit of the prosthesis and the, and the positioning anterior posterior on the full arch cases, if the radiographic template and the surgical template were not in the same positions, then we're drilling in the wrong place, even though we think we're right. At this point, uh, the time is a little bit late. I uh, appreciate those questions that were posed from the audience. And once again, on behalf of the American Academy of Periodontology and the Continuing Education Oversight Committee, we deeply appreciate all the time and effort that went into your